The penultimate season of HBO's Game of Thrones is upon us. The buzz of excitement and anticipation is palpable, as well as a certain sense of dread. Partially because people who have watched the show are finding more ahead in the series than those reading the books, meaning that we can no longer resolve fights in our favor by threatening spoilers, but also because the story of this awesomely complex world is drawing to a close. We explored some of the complexity in this world in the previous episode when we talked about how some researchers use graph theory and network analysis to determine who the main character is. Or, I mean, characters are. You should probably go watch that over here if you want to check out why syntax is tricky here. But we're going to talk about interpersonal relationships more in a future episode. But today, we're going to talk about the world itself. Or at least its history. Because the history of Westeros can tell us a lot about our own. There is a certain truth in fiction, after all. Menenessa. Here are three themes present in Westerosi history that mirrors our own. There are obviously going to be some minor spoilers ahead, so you know, just, just, just be advised. 1. Rome, the Lord of Light, and Social Control According to the story's lore, Rothlor, the God of Light, comes to guide humanity away from darkness and into a warm, eternal glow. The Lord of Light promises happiness, salvation, and even prophesies that a savior prince who will rise up and relinquish the forces of evil. Sound familiar? It definitely parallels the core beliefs of the Abrahamic faiths, you know, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, but the way it works in the show definitely resonates most strongly with Christianity. I mean, there's the parallel symbolism of light as virtue, the existence of a single heaven, and the fact that people are literally resurrected. I mean, come on, how obvious can you get? But how that religion is practiced in Marine is pretty interesting when you stop to think about it. Marine's strongest real-world parallel is ancient Rome, you know, ignoring the giant pyramids which are really just a huge red herring. The style of dress, the ready access to wine, the Egypt had beer in case you were wondering, the usage of slaves is everything from laborers to teachers, and of course, the gladiatorial combat all point to Rome being the main thing that it was based on. But the way that the priests of the light can influence the former slaves of Marine mirrors the appeal that Christianity had for the slaves of the Roman Empire. Christianity promised equality before the eyes of God, bliss in the hereafter, and eternal absence from the chains that both literally and figuratively bound their mortal coil. Because of this existing grassroots appeal, the Roman elite found it possible to use the church as a form of social control once the empire recognized it as its official religion in the 4th century ACE. A similar thing was done with the religion of Rothlor in Marine in the hopes of preventing the city from burning itself to the ground in the face of social unrest between the former slaves and their former masters. And spoiler alert, it actually worked. The city didn't burn itself to the ground. Which is actually a pretty impressive feat considering the fact that the city literally housed dragons for a number of years. Two. Women in power. Unlike the last thing, this isn't so much a particular instance so much as it is a more general observation about the show. The female characters are famously well written. In fact, when asked about how he made such good female characters, Martin famously replied that he, you know, just kind of thought of them as people. Which is just such a good response, like, oh my god. But not only are they well written, their ability to navigate the constraints of their day mirrors how real women in our world were able to do so as well. Many people look back on our history and just assume that women didn't have much of a contribution to make since society was highly patriarchal and had institutions of discrimination everywhere you looked. I don't want to discount the fact that the prevailing social matrix was, and in many instances still is, pockmarked by sexism. It truly has been for much of human history. But that didn't completely immobilize women. It certainly hindered them, but many extraordinary individuals were capable of working within its constraints in order to make a name for themselves. The show has its analogs for this. It has Marjorie Tyrell and her grandmother, Cersei Lannister, Arya and Sansa Stark, as well as their mother Catelyn, all of whom reached various positions of very real power due to their unique ability to navigate and strategically exploit the constraints that their society imposed upon them. Not to mention Daenerys Targaryen, who brute forces her way through the Matrix and becomes a force all of her own. And the reason they're analogs is because reality has plenty of our own exemplars. There was the Pharaoh Hepshetsut, Egypt's first definitive female regent, Empress Wu of Tang China, who started off as a consort and whose political cunning allowed her to become a highly impactful ruler in her own right, Roxolana of the Ottoman Empire, Empress Theodora of the Byzantine, Catherine the Great of Russia, the infamous Chinese pirate Shangxi. I could go on, I won't, but I could, and that's exactly the point. Number three, the fact that we really don't know crap about it. Think about the world and history of Westeros for a minute. From what perspective is most of the story drawn? The political elite and the powerful. The story and drama is all their own. Lesser lords are barely mentioned, not to mention normal folk. It is, after all, a Game of Thrones. Normies need not contend. The only instance that we get of everyday people is when their lives briefly intersect with the plot. Or, more accurately, when their deaths intersect with the plot. This is George R. R. Martin, after all. Even if you scour through the world's lore, you'll find very scant mention about the life of a baker's boy or of an unsullied. The books of the Maesters were often not dedicated to the lives of extraordinary men. And as I was just saying, only the most exceptional women even received any worthwhile mention, but they still received more than ordinary people. And that's not even getting into the free folk, the entirety of their narrative depth can fit inside of a thimble. 
This is going to prove quite problematic to future archaeologists and historians of Westeros when they realize that the vast preponderance of the people who actually lived on the continent, they don't know a thing about. And the thing is, this is how it is for us, too. As Dr. Robert Garland often bemoans in his lecture series, The Other Side of History, we don't know much about how the vast preponderance of people lived in our world, either. We have a lot on the elites because they were the people who could either write the books or pay the other people to write the books for them, precious little on the middle class if the society in question even had an analog to what we would consider middle class, and virtually nothing on the lower classes except what was written about them. Like with the Maesters, our world's literary elite was also focused on the exceptional, the legendary, histories that were equal parts facts, bias, and propaganda. They avoided the mundane like the plague. Well, actually, for a while they were better at avoiding the mundane than they were the plague, but the point still remains. Compared to the total sum of what actually has happened, we really don't know that much. What do you guys think? How well does Westerosi history resonate with our own? Are there other instances between our history and theirs that you can think of that I didn't have time to maybe mention in the video? And how much of this do you think is due to a concerted effort on the author's part versus him just drawing from the same sociocultural well? Let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments below. I look forward to reading all of them and answering a few of them in the next office hours. Links for everything as always will be down in the doo-doo as well as links to the Facebook, the Twitter, and the blog. I look forward to seeing you guys out there as well. If you enjoyed this video, hope you consider liking it. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so by sharing this video and by clicking the subscribe button to stay in the loop for more awesome social science content is uploaded. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time. I'm not sick, you're sick.